I'm just kidding with you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Facebook family and friends. Um, glad you're joining us on Sunday morning. Hey, the people in here look beautiful. 4,000 and we just continue to increase. We're thankful for the blessing. Um, everybody's here. I Don't call us because we have too many people in the building. That's that would be bad. That would be bad. Um, today's message, for some of you, is going to sound like a repeat. Especially, especially to my Tuesday night group. I've always said this about God sharing a message. Can you turn me down just a little bit, maybe in the monitor or something? I feel like I'm screaming at myself. For some reason, God has been speaking clearly to me about our focus. Because right now, whether you tune into which, which channel you like for your news, whether you watch it nightly at 6, 5.30, early Fox, or go at 11, whatever time, I grew up always, that's how you knew the end of the day was coming. TV kind of stopped around 11, then you had your 11 to 11.30, then you had your night show, tonight show, and boom, the flag came up, it was done. TV was over. But our focus, I believe, unlike any time in my lifetime, is being distracted. Things are being thrown at us, and we're going, oh, and then this, this, and we, we lose focus. We have a major hurricane that hits uh, Louisiana and goes through, and, but we're not focused on that because we're focused on what these people are choosing to do against the law, and these people are saying is what's right. And we go through all this, and we are completely being torn away from focusing on God. I can summarize this sermon right now and finish for all of you, and you can go home and just say, focus on God. But we need to hear that in a way that is biblical and then the way God shared it with his prophet or with his, his messenger today. And that's me. And all of a sudden this whole week when he said, focus forward. What is your, what is your faith? Where is your faith focus? Where are you looking to? Had a good talk with my brother Robert this morning. Distractions. Good job opportunities are quite often distractions. It looks better than the one that you're in, but that's not where you're supposed to be. But you think, well, that looks better, so I'm going to move over there. There's always, grass is always greener, right? Irma Bombeck said grass is always greener over the septic tank. <laughs> right? You look in your yard, it grows real well over the septic tank. You've got a busted sewage pipe. Oh, look out, it's growing real well. But we need to remind ourselves and remember by the Word of God that we're supposed to be focused our faith forward. I started thinking about eyes this week. There are, we have two eyes. And that, eyes. There we go. We have two right here. How many of you have two eyes? Raise your hand. If you don't, I, I feel bad. So I didn't think about that. All of a sudden there's somebody out there with one eye like, sorry. Cyclops. No, I'm not just kidding. But it, most of us in general have two eyes. That's not the same with every creature God created. I started looking at it this week, so I got all my Google and started Googling animal eyes, right? You come up to flounder. Flounder is very interesting, right? At the larva stage, he has two eyes on the opposite side, and then it trans -move, or moves over to the same side. And I thought, poor little flounder only has two eyes, and they're on the same side. But think about it. Flounder's on the bottom, right? But guess what? He's always looking up. Try to encourage you sometimes. Look up to what's... He's always looking up, right? I started thinking about that. Then I thought about the owl. Because you always see owls got those big old eyes, right? You know how, how far an owl can move his eyes? Anybody want to guess? Facebook people? He can't. Owl's eyes don't move. They're not even round. They're actually like a, a tube. His head moves 270 degrees, but his eyes don't. He's always fixed focus right ahead, unless his head moves. His eyes are actually fixed, and he can see real well because they're like binoculars. Instead of having round eyeballs that do all this stuff, his are just binoculars that he has implanted in his head, and he has to move to see, and he can see really well. God wanted that for him. How many of you have ever seen a horseshoe crab? We live in Florida. Right? Where do you see horseshoe crabs at? Dead on the beach. I thought about that when I started looking around. I'm like, nine times out of ten, you don't see them very much often moving. You just see that shell. There's a dead horseshoe crab. You know how many eyes they have? Ten. What? You would think they wouldn't die so easily and be able to see danger, but they have ten eyes and they still can't focus. Everywhere is on them, ten eyes. We only have two. 
If a horseshoe crab can deal with 10, if, uh, if, if flounder can have two on one side, we should be doing pretty good with these two eyes, right? But we don't. Scripture after scripture will tell you what your eyes see. It creeps into your spirit. That's sometimes a lot of things that we let into our lives and into our bodies are through these eyeballs. Because we are just naturally challenged to look. Something happens, what do we do? We look. Don't look, it can blind you. Oh. I can remember elementary school, Dover Elementary, and they tried real hard. We're going to take you outside during the solar eclipse and we're going to look at it, but you have to look at it through this box. And every little kid out there, you're dealing with third graders, right? Oh, there's a box. Where am I supposed to be looking, teacher? You're looking right up at it. And I don't, I, 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 I've never met anybody that said to me, I was blinded because I looked at this. I just, I've never met anyone that has been blinded with that. Our eyes tell us. So I have a question for you this morning. Are you focused? I've been asking you, are you believers in Jesus Christ? Amen, Pastor. I don't forsake the gathering. I'm here. I'm here on Tuesday. I'm here on Wednesday. I got a Bible. I got a necklace. I'm focused. Are you really? What are you focused on? I came up with three things I believe we're not focused right as Christians. The first one is this. Are you focused on the past or the possibilities? Many times I see believers and brothers and sisters in Christ that can't get past their past. For some reason, they, they still dwell on it. They still live in it. They still remember it now. That they know that they're different. They know that they live a different life now. But they still go back to that. When something comes against them, they go back to that. They revert back to that. When they're told something, they revert back to that. That's amazing to think. Because that's not who we're supposed to be as believers. I could not imagine each and every one of you if all of a sudden I were to holler at you and you reverted back to being a two-year-old. Michael Wayne, all of a sudden he curls up in the fetal position, is on the floor going, man, man, I would go, what's wrong with you? That's the past. <laughs> but in our lives, we walk through things and we forget the possibilities that are ahead of us because of the grace and glory of God. And we focus on the past so much that we will bag it up and drag it along with us. Every one of those songs we sing about being free and the chains are broken and all those. And we still are going, my chains are broken, I'm free. We walk outside and we hitch back up to our past and we just carry it on to our next position. Listen, are you focused on the past or possibilities? How about this one? Are you focused on blasphemy or the blessing? Most every one of you in here will say, I'm not a blasphemer. Why? Because no one's ever said that to you. Blasphemy is the rejection of God. Well, I'm a believer, so I don't reject God. So when he tells you to do something, you absolutely do it. And don't revolt. You don't turn away from him. You do exactly what he says. Well, sometimes, blasphemer. They say, well, that's using God's name in vain. I've never cursed like that. I'm telling you, that's not what it means. If you've ever called on God to get you out of a trouble that was your problem and you know it's not the right thing and you think that your way is better and you're ask, asking him to come in line with what you think, you're wrong. Are you revolting or receiving? Don't change it. That's, I looked at blasphemy and I said people are going to get confused over that. Are you revolting or are you receiving? A lot of times we revolt. Why? Because it seems so difficult. It seems like rules. Oh, I don't need another rule in my life. I don't need to be told what to do. I'm an adult. How many of you use that with your parents? Yeah, they're right. Everybody, you don't need to tell me what to do. I'm a grown man. You can't tell me. <laughs> we even say that. And it's so funny that when we do say that, we highlight grown man. Like it's different than saying I'm just a grown man. I'm 52 years old. People sometimes that say to me, don't anybody agree that I act childish? Stop agreeing. Amen. Amen. Thank you there. <laughs> I would like to have a childish spirit when it comes to trusting in God for everything. Last one. Salvation or the service? How many of you are just saved Christians or are you serving Christians? That's a big challenge. That's a difference. 
Many of you have walked the aisle. Traditionally, in a Baptist church, which I grew up, you walked the aisle, you got the clipboard, you filled it out, and you were then saved if you said the right things. <laughs> I can remember being about, how old was I, Mom? About 10. Huh? 10 years old. 10, 11. First Baptist Church of Dover. Big church. Finally made that decision, I'm going to get up out of that pew and I'm going to walk that aisle. And that's a big church. I was scared to death. Because pews make you have to go, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And you know they were saying, you know, every head bowed and every eye closed. And now I've got to interrupt people. And everybody's looking, excuse me. And I was not slender, so I was bumping into everybody. And I remember walking that aisle. The prettiest thing about that moment was that as I was walking forward, my mom was getting up and walking behind me. That was beautiful. She's going to walk that aisle with me. And I walked down there and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I was saved. And I immediately went into a full life service for the Lord. No, I went to school the next day on a Monday. Told some people that I got saved. We had a youth celebration. I got baptized a couple weeks later and all was good. And then all of a sudden high school came in. Ooh. You think high school is bad. Then it's college. I immediately left Plant City at age 17 and moved into a condominium, which I never even knew what that was, until I moved into one in Gainesville, Florida, with three of my best friends. Now, how wise does that sound? <laughs> but we were there for an education. <laughs> yeah. We got educated, all right. Salvation is an experience in a moment. It's supposed to turn the light switch on in your life. It's not supposed to be that which you just share over and over and say, this was the moment I got saved and I did everything else on my own. I want you to remember that moment of change. We all celebrate and remember the day we got married. But I can promise you, if you've been married any length of time, your marriage now is not like that wedding day. Well, yeah, it is. It's an eternal wedding day. Is that right, Elmer? <laughs> I got it not necessarily. Now, it should have been like a prophecy, Kimberly. We should have looked at it from a very religious, eye opening experience and understood that when we got married, it was the worst ice storm in the history of Houston. Still Lord brought a storm on our wedding. Still to this day. Still to this day, we're in the storm? No. Oh, I thought that's what you were saying. <laughs> We have gone through storms, but we've gone through them together. We went through a storm that night, but we were joined together. Listen, salvation is a beautiful, beautiful transition from who you were to something new in Christ. And you're supposed to be serving him as Lord of your life. Not just Savior, but Lord. Let's look at scripture and see what he's talking about, what God is telling us through Paul when he wrote to the church at Philippi. In chapter 3 and verses 12, 3 a, 13, 12 through 13 a. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So where's his focus? Forward. Pressing on. Listen, if you read any of the Palestine epistles, that's what they're called, the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, he's always talking about forward. Moving forward. Paul, even in the middle of strife or an imprisonment or a shipwreck, was always thinking about the next journey and the next purpose that God has for his life. Made perfect, but I press on. He said, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I will stand here humbly as your pastor and say, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of all of it. I grow with you. My Tuesday night men's group, sometimes we look at Scripture together and we, by ourselves, have no clue what it's saying. But once we go through it together, we grow into a knowledge and understanding of what God's saying. But one thing I do, Paul leaves us with, and it transitions to the next verse. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you, there's a lot in that one passage that we could talk about. I forget about what's past. Listen, past may have been struggles, but you've been through it, so you know what to expect. 
It's the future that will strain you. Well, I don't want to be strained. You want to be stronger? You've got to have strain. You realize when you work out to get a muscle stronger, you must strain that muscle. And that muscle will get stronger. If you're not straining forward towards God, you're not growing in God. I want you better tomorrow than you are today. The reason why I stand before you every Sunday and preach the word of God is because you're supposed to be absorbing it, hearing it, and being better when you depart than when you walked in. At least more knowledgeable than you were before. And knowledge has great power. G.I. Joe always said, and now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Nobody watched you. We need to be moving forward towards heaven. We said it on, I think it was Tuesday night. A lot of people say, how many of you would like Jesus to come this afternoon? Some of you, it's not in your schedule. I see that. Not every hand went up. Some of you really aren't ready. You must have great plans for tomorrow. If your plans are greater than going to heaven, let's talk afterwards. All right? Because I can't imagine it being greater. Now, I used to share this with my mom, and mom would say, well, don't you want to see things like George finally meeting that perfect woman and getting married? And then all of a sudden, immediately, I think of them two living upstairs. I'm like, Jesus, take the wheel. I'm ready to go now. Would I love to have grandbabies running around? Little Georges everywhere? I would love that and appreciate that, but I would, greater than that, I would love to be in heaven right now. That's where my focus is, is heaven. As a believer, I know I'm going there. So if I know I'm going there, why would I not plan, prepare, and focus on that? When you know you're going on vacation, you plan, don't you, Ms. Lara? Kimberly can tell you that if we know we're going on a cruise, good Lord, I am planning every moment of everything we do. I am printing out itineraries, and this is exactly what we're going to do. She's like, we're going to just rest for the next hour. Nope, we've got a painting class to go to. We've been to dance classes. We've done all of the... Yes, I dance. Very well. Very well. I like to line dance and break dance. All right. Focus is supposed to be heavenward. He goes on to tell us back in Proverbs from David's writing, he says this, Many are the plans in a man's heart. Kind of a theme we talked about the other night. Really, I'm a planner. But it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy will shall be done. If your plans aren't in line with God's will, His shall be done, and yours will probably fall to the wayside. If any of you today are planning a better way to heaven than through Jesus Christ, I'm sorry to tell you, you will not make it. If any of you thinking are thinking today that being a good person, I know it doesn't have a scripture to support that, but I believe being a good person is going to get me to heaven. I'm telling you that contradicts the word of God and you will not get there. Your plan will fail. The plans of man fade and fall apart. The plans of God are perfect and eternal. If I could sell you something and say, here's a perfect plan that'll last for all eternity, or here's an insurance policy that might get you through the week, which one would you take? But the sad thing is there's a lot of people who aren't accepting and believing that. It also says in Proverbs this, in 16 and 9, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his step. Think about being in the military. You've got one guy, the commander. He stands before the troops. He has planned, he has thought about his attack against the enemy. I can tell you, if you're standing in that formation, every one of you has a thought or idea about how this should go. Here's what we should do as you stand quietly. Here's what I would do as you stand quietly. I think this would be a great way to go as you stand quietly. The commander's orders will trump your thoughts and ideas. 
Because he's the commander. God's commands over our lives and his, his plan and purpose for us should trump the things that we think are better ways. You have great ideas. You have good ideas. But he has God ideas. Right. I had a nice talk with one of the people that I seek counsel from before this service started. Elmer and I had an impromptu discussion. And I think it was the Lord prompting that time. Because as I continue to be the pastor of this church, I am always thinking of the plan. When we started to be church planters years and years and years ago, they gave us a laundry list of 200 things that we must do. They told us, listen to this, they told us we must raise and support $250,000 before we launch the church. We have never had $250,000 in the bank, and we've now been ministering and pastoring at this church, my wife and I, for 14 years. Show me $250,000, we'd be like, what? <laughs> Pastoral limousine, baby. That's what we roll on up in. <laughs> Kimberly didn't know what I was preaching on, but she knew the heart of God and what the Holy Spirit was saying is that we focus on what He tells us to do. And if your entire duration of this church is in this building, you are okay. If we never reach the mega church where it has a rotating stage of circling like I have been looking for, then there we are okay. I'll just have to turn around and around and around. It tells us all this in the Old Testament. Isaiah, who speaks so eloquently, says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. How many of you need strength today? I was sitting here five minutes before service and said, I really don't want to preach today. And the Holy Spirit said, You're going to preach. They will soar on wings like eagles. Woo. I talked about it now, but now we're on soaring like wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. Just the thought of running makes me weary. <laughs> One of our teachers before school started last week, week two ago, was walking down the main mall, and I'm at the front door because I'm the first one there in the morning to open up. After Simone, who opens up the back door, she opens the back door like, 4 a.m. or something. I saw that teacher fall. Every part of my spirit and my brain said, run and assist. And I did. I took off running. Halfway there, I was like, why am I running? This is exhausting. I am not running towards heaven. I am soaring on eagle's wings, and I'm not weary. I'm not weary about preaching. I don't need to take a sabbatical. I don't think that's a wrong thing some pastors do. But I am not going to take a year off from you just to learn more. I learn more from you every day. And they will walk and not be faint. Second Corinthians, Paul says it to this in the church of Corinth. Faith has to be forward focused. He says, we live by faith, not by sight. Why didn't God give us eyes all around our head like he did some of the creatures that guard him around the throne? Why did he not give us a neck that turns around 270 degrees? That would just make you fall down as you're completely distracted walking forward looking backwards. He knew he gave us two eyes to open us, to focus us forward. And he says, I'm going to give you my son. And if you believe in him and trust in him through faith, you will know the way to go. Blind people. Amazing Grace says, I once was blind, but now I see. I don't always think that means the eyes were open. I believe that song says our hearts are blind to the, the faith and knowledge that knows that God is in control and that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And when we remove those blinders of the heart and of the spirit and receive it, we clearly see the path that which we're on. My encouragement to you today is to start living by faith and not by sight. I used to wonder why, when you pray, why do people close their eyes? I remember early on in our church life that I would say, okay, I want you to do something different. Instead of bowing your head and closing your eyes, I want you to lift your head up, look straight up heavenward, and open your eyes clearly. And some people, that was a strain to do. 
Well, that doesn't sound like the way we learned it. Let me tell you. If you're not opening your eyes to Jesus, you're not doing what he wants you to learn. And it is 11 o'clock a.m. Thank you for that alarm that we've gone over. <laughs> Amen. Everybody's alarm going off. <laughs> if you're watching on Facebook, thanks for staying past the 11 a.m. hour. Don't tune off. Don't turn off. Our worship pastor talked a lot today. <laughs> hey. But it was beautiful. And Holy Spirit inspired. That's what you missed. Today we stand at a change in our lives. I want to be your spiritual optometrist. Mm. I want to open your eyes to the truth that is the only truth. I want you to experience love that is real love. I want you to receive grace that covers all. And I want you to start living by faith and not by sight. As the praise team comes up here, Heavenly Father, we are thankful of who you are. We are thankful that your plan is greater than ours. Lord, rip off our blinders. Heal, heal our spiritual eyes. Just as a baby opens those eyes and sees the world for the first time. For some of us, this may be the day that we see truth for the first time. An eye-opening experience. Truth for the first time. Love in reality. Lord God, speak boldly into our spirits. May your faith be clear. And may we trust and receive in Jesus' name.